Years ago, I was living in that sweet spot of young adulthood between college and your first real job, living with two very good friends. We had lived in a larger house with six other people at some point, a feat I can't even quite fathom in this moment. But there were three of us, a young, one young woman and two guys, and we were a little bit protective of her and a little judgmental of the men who came a call. <laughs> she wanted very much like so many of us want to be in love. But a series of lackluster beginnings and fizzled out potentials had left her wanting more, longing a little bit. And into that longing, he came. <laughs> and he was bad news. <laughs> you can imagine the distant sound of a motorcycle revving and heavy metal guitars and him rolling up with a sneer on his face, ready for a fight. He was cute. You can't, you can't take that away from him, and he had an undeniable kind of appeal, especially to the girls who liked that brand of guy who used to be a hockey player but left because there just wasn't enough violence. <laughs> but what solidified us as enemies was the way that he treated my beloved friend. He would appear and disappear run impossibly hot emotionally and then impossibly cold, yanking her heart around. He was the kind of boyfriend you endure a friend having, hoping that it's not for too long. And unsurprisingly, after an arduous and exhausting roller coaster ride of a relationship, they did break up. It was just a few months later that my father died. As I sat in my mother's house making the impossible phone calls, telling the story over and over and over again, surrounded by my own mounting sadness, he called. By this point of the story, he had been out of the picture for a while, but he and my friend had kept in touch just a little bit, and she had told him that my dad had died. I was surprised to hear from him. His tone was nothing like anything I had ever heard from him. Hey, Aaron told me about your dad, he said. My dad died a little over a year ago. It was cancer. It came on really quick. Anyway, I just wanted you to know, if there's anything you need or anything you want, you can tell me. I just wanted you to know. I hadn't known that his dad had just died. I knew he had moved home to be with his mother and his little sister, but I had not heard the whole story. That moment, that tiny conversation from a recent adversary was more helpful than anything anyone said or did for me in my entire grieving process before that moment or since. There was something so simple and so helpful, knowing that someone else had been pretty much exactly where I was right then, and had made it through. I was and am so grateful to him. He was not my enemy. And I know I would have felt differently, I would have treated him differently if I had somehow known about his dad. So this is our focus for our time here this morning. This morning, this month, as we look at compassion, we explore this idea of loving our enemy, of choosing love over and over. And this is important, especially now, as voices and forces in this world try to convince us to close ourselves off to sow and grow in hatred and separation in our hearts, to casually and carelessly build up walls. But our call here, our mission and our purpose together here is different. We are called to open our hearts, to give ourselves over to the power, to the work of love, the transforming, redeeming, saving power of love. Jesus is reported in the fifth chapter of the Gospel, according to Matthew, even to have said, You've heard it's been said, you shall love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. 
Bless them that curse you. Do good to those that hate you. One of the tricky pieces of this teaching is that most of us do not have enemies in the classic sense. Most of us are not in battle, even though we as a nation have been at war for quite some time now. In our daily lives, most of us are not in battle. But there is a war on, many would say. Many will say especially this year, in an election year. Many millions of dollars are about to be spent on advertising, trying to convince us each that there is a battle on for this country, trying to convince us that we are simplifiable, that we are one or the other. We will hear promises and condemnations, we will hear demonizations and attacks, and many of us buy into this oversimplified polarization Many of us buy into the scapegoating, to the view that casts blame squarely at the feet of some, but not all. But of course, the truth is so much more complicated. The truth is that we are all, each and every one of us, tied up impossibly, complexly in a tangle of causes and effects. The truth is that each and every person, all beings, every person is counted when we say in our mission statement the inherent worth and dignity of we commit here every week, over and over, to honor, to respect, to love all people. To take up this holy and demanding work, not to settle for the cheap grace of politicized oversimplification, but to know and strive to know more deeply the path of love for all. Malcolm X spent much of his life very clear that there was an enemy and that it was the white man. But that polarity, that duality, that wall within him dissolved on a pilgrimage to Mecca he made late in his too young life. In a letter home he wrote, I have been blessed to visit the holy city of Mecca. There were tens of thousands of pilgrims from all over the world. They were all colored from blue-eyed blondes to black-skinned Africans, but we were all participating in the same ritual, displaying a spirit of unity and brotherhood that my experiences in America had led me to believe never could exist between white and non-white. Throughout my travels in the Muslim world, I have met, talked to, even eaten with white people who in America would have been considered other. I've never before seen sincere and true brotherhood practiced by all colors together. You might be shocked by these words coming from me, but on this pilgrimage, what I have seen and experienced has forced me to rearrange much of the thought patterns previously held, to toss aside some of my previous conclusions. During these 11 days, I have eaten from the same plate, drunk from the same glass and slept in the same bed on the same rug while praying to the same God with fellow Muslims whose eyes were the bluest of blue, whose hair was the blondest of blonde, whose skin was the whitest of white, and in the words and in the actions and in the deeds of the white Muslims I felt the same sincerity I felt among the black African Muslims of Nigeria, Sudan, and Ghana. Upon his return to the States, Malcolm X started inviting all people to come together and work for liberation. He said he would work with anyone, no matter what the color of their skin, if they wanted to help solve the miserable circumstance which faced people. He realized there on the pilgrimage this truth that we know so well, that somewhere deep inside, past our pet delusions and fears, the truth that we are ultimately united, connected, woven in shared destiny and fate. Conservatives, liberals, libertarians, Democrats, anarchists, republicans, monarchists, independents, undecided, and more importantly, the great mass of apathetics and uncares. <laughs> Each and every one of us is woven together in this life facing the same fears and joys, kissed by the same winds, warmed by the same sun. And seeing that connection, knowing that connection, we cannot
cannot help but love, knowing that your fate is wrapped up in mine, that all of the people sitting right now on all sides of you are connected and one with you and of the whole of South Church and the whole of the seacoast, the whole of the human family, there is no enemy, only more love waiting to take root in our hearts. There is no enemy, only deeper understanding waiting to break like dawn over our minds. Throughout his ministry, Martin Luther King preached regularly, at least once a year, a sermon called Loving the Enemy. As he was facing the vehement hatred and continual death threats, as his people were being beaten and killed and dehumanized, he called all of us to love. In one of those sermons, he writes. Now there's a final reason I think that Jesus says, love your enemies. It's this. Love has within it a redemptive power. There is a power that eventually transforms individuals. That's why Jesus says, love your enemies. Because if you hate your enemies, you have no way to redeem and transform your enemies. But if you love your enemies, you will discover that the very root of love is the power of redemption. You just keep loving people. Keep on loving them, even if they're mistreating you. Here's the person who's your neighbor. And this person's doing something wrong and all that. You just keep being friendly to that person. Keep loving them. Don't do anything to embarrass them. Just keep loving them. And they can't stand it too long. They'll react <laughs> in the beginning. They'll react with bitterness. They'll be mad because you love them like that. But the power of your love will break them down. That's love. You see, it's redemptive. This is why Jesus tells us to love. There's something about love that builds us up and is creative. There's something about hate that tears us down and is destructive. So love your enemies. He concludes, so this morning, as I look into your eyes, into the eyes of all my brothers, all my sisters in Alabama and all over America, all over the world, I say to you, I love you. I would rather die than hate you. And I'm foolish enough to believe that through the power of this love somewhere, men of the most recalcitrant bent will be transformed. There is no enemy. Only more love waiting to take root in our hearts. Only deeper understanding waiting to break like dawn over our minds. Whenever you feel your heart contract, whenever you feel yourself about to condemn, about to slip into oversimplified separation, when you feel rage set in, vehemence, anger, when you see an enemy, remember the love of Dr. King as he faced unspeakable. Remember the scales falling from Malcolm's eyes. Remember that bad boyfriend and his just right words. No enemy in the face of this love.